I realized as I was praying that the first thing I have in my notes is, is introducing myself, and I just asked God to have more of him and less of me. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is myself. So um, there's a little hypocrisy there, I think. Um, I'm Mark Michelle. Um, I'm one of the associate pastors here at the bridge, and I'm really excited. I love getting the opportunity to share God's word. And when the opportunity arose that Todd was going to be out of town this weekend, I jumped at the opportunity to share. Um, little did I know um, that I'd be uh, preaching out of Malachi. <laughs> um, and minor prophets uh, some, can sometimes be a little bit intimidating. Uh, so we've been studying the Maya prophets for the last couple weeks, um, and uh, Dr. Norbeck started two weeks ago, and he, uh, he asked the question, are we questioning God's love for us? And Malachi 1 starts out, and God says, I love you. And the first thing that, that the people of Israel says, how did you love me? And God goes and kind of explains. And then uh, last week, Todd was preaching, and uh, was teaching, and, and, and the question that was asked, are we honoring God? I'm going to tell you guys something probably haven't noticed this, um, but every, uh, uh, every sermon title for this series has had a question, if you see now, okay, questions from God, um, and, uh, and normally when we have uh, series, you don't necessarily always pick up on that, but like we've got this document that has all of them on, and I'm like, boy, there's a question, I wonder if the congregation even knows that every one of these sermons has a question in it, so I'm just telling you, this is a question every week, and, uh, and last week it was, are we honoring God? And, uh, and it was uh, talking about how um, priests weren't honoring God. And, and, and Todd pushed us to ask, are we honoring God and what we're doing? And so we're going to continue that today with uh, Malachi chapter 2. So if you guys want to turn to, uh, to Malachi chapter 2, we're going to read the first nine verses. And so if you um, want to follow along, um, that would be great. And now, oh priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take part to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send curses upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and spread dung on your faces, and the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave it to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name, true instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked, in, he walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. From the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, and, but you have turned aside from the way, you have caused many to stumble from, by your instruction, and you have corrupt the covenant of Levi. The Lord says the Lord of hosts, and I will make you despised and abased before all the people, insomuch as you do not keep my ways and do not show partiality in your instruction. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Every time I'm getting ready to preach, one of the very first things I do is I read the passage, and the first thing I do is I ask questions. What is a question a non-Christian would ask? What is a question that a believer would ask? Where, what questions do I have from this passage? And I think that if you're re listening to what I just read or following along, there should be two questions that come to your mind right away. The first question is, whose idea was it to give the youth pastor the sermon about God? <laughs> This seems like a pretty poor idea. I'm just I, That seems like I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> um, but the second question, and I think you should have all asked her this, is what does this have to do with me? The very first thing it says is, now, O oh priest, this I command, this command is for you. Or how many of us here are priests? It's interesting that we're doing a sermon that's talking to the priests and condemning them and telling them what they've done wrong. And Dr. Norbeck and Todd are out of town. So uh, Andy, if you want to come up, you can sit right here. I'll preach to you exclusively. Because um, apparently this is just for Andy. No, uh, this is not just for uh, the priests. Um, this was written in a time when the priests were failing. The priests were making a lot of mistakes. But we live in a time today where the priest's role has changed. Uh, after Jesus died and rose again, 
He became our ultimate sacrifice. And so we don't need that role of the priest anymore. In fact, when we were studying Hebrews, Hebrews spends a whole lot of time telling us, we have a great high priest and his name is Jesus. And so the, the role of priest in the New Testament changes. And so there's some ideas here that I think that we can, we can glean from what it is. And, and more importantly, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen race and a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All of us are priests. All of us take the role of ministers. And so, yes, this passage is dealing with a specific time, but the failures of the priest are things that we should look at in our own life. The, the things that he calls the priest to are standards that we should call ourselves to. And not just me because I'm a pastor, but all of us. If you're a parent, you're a minister, you're investing in the lives of your, your, your son or daughter. If you're married, you're investing in the lives of, of your spouse. If you've got friends, you're investing in their lives. These are all ministries. When we ask the question, are we, have we brought people closer to God? It isn't just salvation. It's discipleship. It's helping people grow. And we have all been called. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all men. And it wasn't exclusively for the priests. It was for all of us. And so the standard that's been set here is a standard for all of us. So when, I, when you ask the question, what does this have to do with me? This has to do for all of us. So as I said, they've, uh, we've been studying this for two weeks, or for two weeks before this. So this is the third week. And last week, Todd was talking um, about the part one of this passage. He, he was talking about, what, uh, about uh, honoring God. That was the big complaint that God had. And these two passages were probably meant to be read together. And so I just want to do a little brief update on what that was last week, what God's uh, call against the, against the priest was. He said that they weren't giving glory and honor due to their father. He, he said that they were giving, they were accepting second-rate offerings. It, they were accepting uh, damaged sheep, uh, blind sheep, uh, uh, bruised uh, fruits and vegetables. The offerings that they were accepting were wrong. God, in his word, said that these were, these were acceptable offerings, and the priests were just taking whatever they would get for giving. In fact, he goes so far as to say that the priests started to hold the, the, the entire offering system in contempt, and we're seeing the ministry that they were doing as a job. It was, how can I get more? How can I get paid for this? What is, what is the things that I'm doing? And so the, 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 the priests were no longer looking at their role as someone to serve people, but they were holding their role in contempt. And they were, they, they, they were just seeing this as work. They weren't loving their ministry. And so honor was a big deal. And so as we continue and look at this passage, um, it starts out, it says, now a priest, this command is for you, if you will not listen. We have priests who have already proven to, to them to God, that they're not listening. God said, you can only bring these offerings. And they said, no, we're going to take whatever, we, whatever you give us. And, and, and they're not listening to God. They're not listening to his word. If we want to be good ministers of the gospel, we need to be people of the word. I know, I know. As soon as I tell you guys that you're supposed to read your Bible, that's just going to be like, yeah, 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 you're right. Or what's going to happen, this is my favorite, because I, I, I know none of you have done this, but I've done this, where I've, I've been in a sermon, and somebody tells me, shows me God's Word, you need to start reading God's Word, and I'm here, and I get really excited, and I think, yes, I'm going to go home, and starting tomorrow, I'm going to start, and I'm going to study every day. I'm going to get up early, and I'm going to read, and also that alarm goes off, and you know that snooze button is the most wonderful thing in the world. But did you know that it is impossible for us as believers to say we love God and to say that we hate God's word? Or to say we love God 
and to say that we are not going to spend any time in God's Word. Let me give you an earthly example. And I know none of you have ever done this, so just understand that this is my problem and not yours. Um, some Sundays I get home and I turn on football. Am I the only one who does that? Okay, so I turn on football. And my wife, whom I love greatly, will come over while I'm watching the game. And I'm not a one-track-minded guy. I'm not a person who's focused in super on what I'm doing or anything like that. Never. No. No, I'm really good at multitasking if you ask me. <laughs> I'm really good at multitasking in my own mind. And my wife will walk in the room and she'll go, Mark. And then she'll start talking to me. And then she'll ask that horrible, horrible question. Did you hear what I just said? Now, at that moment, I am tempted to lie. I am tempted to say, of course I've heard what you said. Because if I do, then what happens? What did I just say? And at that moment, the question is no longer about knowledge. The question is no longer about what do I know. The question is about my respect for her. Do I honor my wife by saying she is more important than football? Because if I'm not listening to her, what am I telling her? That that play that I just watched was more important than what she was doing, than what she was. That thing I'm working on in the garage is more important than what she, she had to say. The same thing is with God. We, 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 God says, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? And how do we listen to God? We read his word. And I, I, I know that every one of you in this room has absolutely no problem reading your word. You get up every morning and you, get, you read your Bible first thing in the morning, you read it before you go, go to bed, or, or whatever, and you all have perfect daily devotions. Because that's how we all act, right? When we're at church, we all have to act that way. But the reality is, is that God's issue with, the, with this group of priests is that they're not listening to him. Are we believers that listen to God? Are we believers that are known for looking at his word? It becomes the thing of honor. How important is God in our lives? I was in a, I was at men's breakfast the other, the other day and we were sitting around the table and God's word came up. And as we were discussing it, a bunch of the guys at the table gave their, gave their reasons why they weren't reading regularly. And some of them had really good excuses. Really good excuses. I couldn't have argued with their excuses. But my wife was having the same discussion in her Bible study. And she told me that when the girls in her Bible study were talking about the same thing, she turned to them and said, did you know the enemy is going to give you every excuse possible to not read God's word because the thing he doesn't want us to do is to listen to God. Our excuses are great for not reading. Our excuses are awesome. I bet you if I started going around the room, every excuse would be better than the next. I don't have time. I work too late. Kids got too many games to go to. I got all this other stuff to do. But here, God's charge against the priests is they're not listening. Are we a people that listen? Or are we a people that do it on our own strength? His next thing he says here is if you will not take the heart and give honor to my name, Once again, like last week when we talked about it, God's honor is important. Are we bringing glory to God's name? Have we put God in his right place in our lives? I know, this is like, you know, like Sunday School 101. You know, read your Bible and put God number one in your life. Like, we've all heard this before. Why is it we've all heard it before and we're all so bad at it? Why is everything else more important than God in our lives? I mean, sure, he might be second or third 
<laughs> he's got a pretty good ranking. Or maybe he's 57th. But why is something always more important? And his charge to the people whose job it is to minister to the people of Israel, his charge against the people who are supposed to be ministering to the people of Algonquin. Is why don't you make me the priority I'm supposed to be? Why don't you make me the, 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 the number one in your life? Because I deserve nothing less than number one. And some reason we put everything else above it. Every one of those excuses for not reading our Bible is telling us what's more important than God. And here it is, God is charging this group of believers, this, this group of priests, that you aren't honoring me the way you're supposed to. We jump down to verse 8, because he, he makes charges later, and I just want to put it all together. So, uh, verse 8, he says, You've turned aside from the way. I know this doesn't make any sense. This is crazy, right? They stop reading God's word. They stop putting God in his position of honor. And what happens? They turn away from God and start sinning. I mean, this is logical, right? This happens. We stop reading God's word. We stop putting him in the position of honor. And then our lives start to go down the toilet. We start living the way we want to live and the way that we want to do it. And this is what God is charging the priests with. You stop reading my word. You stop putting me in the position of honor. And what happens? You start living the way that you want to live. And the first thing that he says then, and right after that, is that um, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. He's, he's saying because of their unfaithfulness, he's invited the rest of Israel to do exactly the same thing that they're doing. If you're not spending time in God's word, if you're not honoring him, you start to live a life that doesn't look like Jesus anymore. You start to live a life that doesn't look the way that it's supposed to as a believer. And then those people that we're supposed to be ministering to, our family, our friends, our kids, people at work, they start to see that. And they think, oh, well, if Mark's a Christian and he treats people like that, then it must be okay. Or that's how all Christians are going to treat people. Or, or, or Mark uses that kind of language. Or Mark starts to see women as objects. Or Mark does all of these things and he says he's a Christian, then this must be okay. This is the charge he has against these priests, is that they're not listening, they're, not doing, they're doing all these things. And because of that, people are stumbling. This goes on in verse 9, it says, I will make you, uh, in, in as much as you keep my ways, and uh, uh, do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your teaching. They stop reading God's word, they stop honoring God, they start living for their sin, and others are stumbling, and then they start teaching only the things that they want to teach. They start only taking parts of God's word that they want to serve, and they pick and choose. In this age of deconstruction in the last five years, this is one of the things I've seen Christians who start to deconstruct their faith do all of the time. They start picking and choosing what parts of Scripture they want to use, picking and choosing what part of the Bible they want to say is good, and they say, okay, this part's good, and this part's bad, and this part's good, and they start separating it out. And before they know it, they say, this is the part of the Bible I like. But you've gone and you've taken a God who's holy, a God who's set apart, and a God who's above you, and you've changed him to your image. And I like this God that I've made to look just like me, and he agrees with everything I say. You've stopped worshiping God, and you've once again started worshiping yourself. This part of the Bible makes me feel warm and fuzzy. This Bible makes me feel this part of the Bible makes me feel good. And all the other stuff I'm going to forget about. 
Or I'm not going to call somebody else out on their sin because I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't, I don't want to make them feel worse. I don't want to lose their relationship. So I'm going to lie to them and tell them that what they're doing is okay. Have you ever done that? I had a guy in my life uh, a while ago um, who, who was in one of my Bible studies and he repeatedly kept failing. And he was hurting other people. And I kept telling myself, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to take this guy for coffee and have a conversation with him. But you know what, I'm, I'm going I'm to wait till the end of the summer and wait till school starts back up and life gets back to normal. Well, you know, now that school started back up, you know, maybe I'll wait till after Christmas. Because, you know, I mean, we get really busy. Oh, you know, now, now he started playing sports at school, so you know what, I'm just going to let it go. Yeah, I did that for three years with a student. I was had an excuse not to call him out. And why? Because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. And so when he graduated high school and started and went away to school, that sin that he was a part of started to snowball. And before you knew it, he was in, he he'd gotten himself so separated from God. They said he didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And I think, what would have happened if at that first moment I would have said something to him? But I had an excuse for every single one. I picked and showed, I showed partiality in my instruction because I didn't want to hurt his feelings, because I didn't want to hurt our relationship. I failed that young man. This is what he's got against the priests of Malachi's day. And because this is what he has against them, he sends his judgment. In verse 2, he says, I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it a heart. God is saying, I take sin seriously. If you're my priests, if you're my ministers, if you're Christians, I take your sin seriously. He says, the first thing, I am going to curse you. I am going to send the curse to you. And your blessings, those words that you're saying, the things that you're supposed to be blessing other people, I'm going to curse that. In fact, because you've been so Entrenched in sin already, I'm going to continue to curse you. Three times in this passage, he said he's going to curse them. Now, I don't know about you, but if God says he's going to curse me once, I'm scared. If God says it twice, I'm in trouble. Like, seriously. And three, I, there's no hope in that third time. God is saying, I take church failures seriously. And he goes on, and uh, here we go. Uh, um, it says, Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and I will spread dung on your face. The dung from your offerings, and you, shall, and you shall be taken away with it. This is graphic language. This is pretty gross. But you need to understand that the priests of Malachi's day were ultimately butchers. Uh, there, was, there were parts of, there were people that were part of the Levitical Covenant, there were people that were part of, 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 of um, that, were, that were priests, and their job was to butcher the animals. And so before they would get offered as sacrifices, the animals would come in and they would take the skin off, and then they would cut off the entrails, and because the dung was part of that, this was considered unclean. And so there was a parts of that what they would do is that they would take that and then they would take that dung and all the entrails and all that stuff and they would take it outside of the temple and they would burn it. And what God is saying here is that I'm going to take that which is considered unclean because it's dung and gross and I'm going to wipe it on your face as a priest which immediately disqualifies you from being a priest but that's okay because you've already disqualified yourself. I'm just letting you know that I know that you're disqualified. And I'm going to remove you from the temple 
and I'm, you might as well be burned with that stuff. God takes sin seriously. And, and he goes on and he says that you will be despised and abased by the people because of what you've done. He takes these people that have messed up and have fallen and he says that, that I am going to curse you. I'm going to make you unqualified for the ministry. I'm going to prove and show you that you are unqualified for the ministry that you've already done. I'm going to throw you out and you might as well be burned with that stuff. I want to take a side note here. I know for a fact there are people in this, in this sanctuary, there's people watching online who have been hurt by church leadership. That there are people that have been, been hurt and there's, there's people that have uh, uh, had, had pastors or had church leadership hurt them. I want you to know that God is 10,000 times more angry about that hurt than you are. God is so angry at church hypocrisy. And, and, and the worst part of that is, is that when we get hurt by church, when we get hurt at church, we compound the, the damage done by being mad at God and walking away from God. And I want you to know that God is more hurt than you are. And God promises that, that vengeance is his and that he will repay. And, and you don't want you don't want to let hypocritical leaders from your past drag you down to the same destruction that they have. It hurts. It stinks. I've been there. I've been hurt by church leadership. I've, 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 I've been there and I understand. And it is so easy to get mad and throw your hands up because of broken people. But if you look at this passage, God is more angry than you are, because I'm pretty sure that when the church hurt you, you didn't think the first thing I wanted to do was smear dung on their face. And yet God says, that's how angry he is. Don't let broken leaders hurt your relationship with God. Okay. So that was all the bad news. You start reading these Old Testament minor prophets and it's just a hammer. I'm just sitting here just beating and beating and beating. And I know that. But God says, this is what a good minister looks like. I'm going to read uh, verses 5 to 7 here. Um, it says, My covenant with him was one of peace. And I gave uh, them to him. And it was a covenant of fear. And he feared me. And he stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. God says this is an example of what a good priest should look like. I've shown you what the failure looks like. These are the things that, that these priests were doing wrong. But this is the deal I made when I made a covenant, when I made the Levitical covenant. Now, the Levitical covenant, I went down this rabbit hole of Levitical covenant um, because it isn't necessarily nailed down the way you think it would be in the Old Testament. They're probably referring to, um, to Numbers chapter 25 in this passage. Um, and I know all of you guys know Numbers 25 like the back of your hand, but for those of you who don't, let me explain to you the situation of where Numbers 25 comes from. Uh, the people of Israel are roaming the desert, and they've decided to camp. And they camped uh, near, Mo, uh, near some Moabites. And these Moabites are worshiping Baal. And some of the men think, huh, those Moabite women are a whole lot nicer than these women I've been roaming around the desert with. And they go and they start hooking up with them. And when they start hooking up with them, they are invited to these ceremonies of Baal. And so they go and they, they celebrate Baal. Well, before you know it, the men of Israel are worshiping Baal and, and, and offering sacrifices to Baal because of these women that they're hooking up with. And God sends a plague through, through the camp. And Moses stands up and says, we need to kill the men who are, who are causing this, this to happen. And as, he's, and, and as the, the, the people of Israel are gathering, this guy walks up with his new... Moabite hookup, and he goes and invites and introduces them to his family. And this 
guy Phineas, who is Aaron's grandkid, sees this and is offended that this man would bring this woman who is making people fall away into the house of the Lord. So he grabs a spear and he runs it through both of them. Man, talk about dung, I'm talking about spears. I'm like, crazy what we're talking about today. And uh, anyway, because of this, as soon as he kills these two people, the plague's lifted. God sees this as a good thing, that, that, that his jealousy for the Lord was equal to what God was, how God was being jealous for the people of Israel. And in verse 5, or verse 11, in, verse, in uh, Numbers 25, it says, Phinehas, the son of Elzer, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and he was jealous of my jealousy among them, so that, that it did not consume the people uh, of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, behold, I give him, uh, hear this, my covenant of peace, which is what we just talked about, and it shall be with him and his descendants after the covenant and a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous of uh, for, his, for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. This covenant he's talking about is that Phineas feared God, and we'll see that, and he responded to what he needed to do, and because he did that, God said, you are going to be part of my priesthood forever, perpetually. And so that's what he's referring to here uh, in, in Malachi. And the first thing it says here is that, uh, that, that the covenant will be one of life and peace. Uh, and then he says, the covenant was a fear because he feared me. Those of us who believe, those of us who are Christians, need to fear God. And this isn't that God's going to chuck a lightning bolt at us. Um, it isn't that he's going to rub dung on our faces. It's we're, we're, we're fearful of him because we honor him. We're fearful of him because he loves us and because he's out there and because he's so much greater than us. And it's an honor and it's a respect that we have for him. This is the priest that God wants to have. And it says that he stood in awe of my name. So once again, that, that honor and that respect that he has, that the, that the, the good priest of the Lord is one who's going to fear God and honor his name. True instruction was in his mouth. And no wrong was found on his lips. How does true instruction get on our lips? You have to know your Bible. You, you, you have to be engaged. You have to be listening to God. And here he's saying, if, if you're a priest of mine, if you're a minister of mine, if you're somebody who's trying to be a Christian in this world, truth needs to be on your lips. And how does truth get on your lips? You've got to be studying your Bible. And when you do that, it says here, he walked in my peace and uprightness. He walked with God. We need to be people who speak the truth and live the truth. And the only way we get to that is if we're listening to God. And he turned many from iniquity. The priest that was there was making many fall. And because he's living a righteous life, this one, and he's listening to God's word, he's bringing people closer to God. Which is what we've all been called to do. We've all been called to bring people closer to God. The lips of the priest should guard knowledge. They shouldn't be picking and choosing what parts of scripture they use. They should use it all. And they should be guarding the whole of scripture. And when they hear somebody say, didn't the Bible say this? They should say, no, it did. Or yes, it did. Let me show you where it says that. It doesn't mean you have to be a Bible scholar. But it means that you need to know God's word. You need to be able to hear when it's true and when it's not. And people should seek the instruction from his mouth. A good priest is going to have fruit. A good believer is going to have fruit in their lives. And so I ask you, which believer are you? Which priest are you? Are you the one that's ignoring God's voice, not listening to God's voice? 
None of us want to admit that one. But are you the one that's, that's dove into his word and love his word? Are you seeing fruit? And what fruit are you seeing? Are the people in your life growing closer to God or further away from God because of you? Malachi is saying that there's this higher standard that we as believers have to have. It isn't just the people standing up here and preaching. It isn't just the people leading worship. It's all of us. We need to have this standard. We need, we need to have this level that requires just a little work. But so often, I know this is from my own, my own belief, is that that first priest, that's the lazy one. And it is so easy to be lazy, isn't it? Isn't it easy to just have every excuse to be that one? But we've been called to make disciples of this entire world. We've been called to make disciples of the world that God has put you in. Your friends, your family, the people you work with. The kids. Are you seeing fruit in those relationships? Are we bringing people closer to God? If you're not, I know this is obvious. I know you've heard this a thousand times. I'm not breaking new ground here. But maybe you need to spend some time in God's Word. Maybe He needs to be the priority instead of whatever the priority is that's in front of you. Because God takes it seriously when we don't. And I'm not pointing anybody else out. I'm pointing myself. Sometimes I put God much lower than he needs to be. Sometimes my Christian walk is what is the least amount of work I can do without upsetting God. The reality is he doesn't deserve that. He needs to be the priority for us. He needs to be the God that's holy, that's set apart, that isn't in my image, it's in his. It's the image that I want to be more like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive us for the times when we make you less. Forgive us for the times when we don't put the energy into our walk the way we should. Lord, we want to see our communities, our friends, our families grow closer to you. Lord, I ask that you forgive us for the times when we don't do that. When we've been a detriment. I ask, Lord, that you put a passion in our hearts, put a passion in my heart for your word and your better. Personally, I pray. Amen.